So generally speaking, inverse functions are functions that undo each other. So I think about inverses as like my little twin sisters who whenever I would do something, they would undo it. Sorry, Maggie and Katie. So like for example, if my one function was x squared, the function that undoes it is root x. And the notation for inverse is a little exponent of negative 1. Um, what would the opposite function or inverse function of 3x be? 1 third x. You multiply a number by 3, you undo that by dividing that number by 3. And doing those repeated operations is an example of function composition. You do one thing and then do something else to the answer that you got. Um, when I first give this example in like an Algebra 1 or Algebra 2 class, I begin with like a potato picture. And I say, here's my x's, and they're 1, 2, and 3. And they go to my y's that are 1, 4, and 9. Let's make it an obvious pattern. So 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 4, 3 goes to 9. That is, that's the function f. <coughs> the function f inverse takes that and reverses it. The x's are now 1, 4, and 9, and 1 is paired with 1, 4 is paired with 2, 9 is paired with 3, and that's the inverse. So if I take 2 to 4, they're like, aha, I'm going to undo you, I'll take 4 to 2. If I say 3 to 9, they're like, nah, I'm going to undo you, you're going to take 9 back to 3. So in that case, the operation I chose was to square and then square root. But notice what happens with that. What happens to the domain of f? Where does it go in y? This domain is all the x's, right? The x's over here become the y's over there. What happens to the y's over here? They become the x's over there, right? In order to undo what someone's done, you've got to take their outputs and change them back what the inputs were, right? So this is a process of reversing things. And one technicality is that certain functions, one more picture, then I'll explain, we'll move on. If I say did negative one and one, and I did the same operation I was doing, and I squared them, they're both gonna go to what number? One, does that make sense? And if you try to undo that, where do you send one? Do you send 1 to negative 1, or do you send 1 to positive 1? How do you decide? And what's the problem with the second picture? Is that a function? Yeah, the second picture is not a function because functions are predictable. You put in an input, you get out one output. I told my high school kids they want them as machines. They're, this is a machine that has two buttons that say Coke. You push bu this button and that button, and they both give you Coke, right? Try to undo that. The question is, which button did it come from, button 1 or button 2? You don't know. Like, so you push the Coke button and you get Sprite or Coke sometimes. We just don't know which. So that's one technicality we have to discuss about making sure certain functions can be functions. And the way you make x squared and root x be functions, you've got to only take certain x's. That's all. It's a, it's a technicality, but it's, 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 it's just something you should know. <coughs> so a function is called 1, 2, 1 if it never takes on the same values twice. That is the, I have a yeah, quick. So on that one, the one thing, so we can't do it. Yep, that's a function that's not invertible. Okay. Yep, exactly, because the inverse that you get is not a function. So if that was to come up, what would, what would we say? We'll get to it, okay. okay. Just let me get there, because we'll get to it with the actual equations as opposed to, you have to make a domain restriction, just look at part of the picture. We'll do it with x squared. Okay, so a one-to-one -one function means that one x goes to one y. That's kind of the, where the word comes from. So one x goes to one y. In other words, the y's are not equal if x is not equal. That's what that second statement says. Your y's are different if your x's are different. So is that true for x squared? Are the y's different whenever the x's are different? In other words, you think of an example where the x's are different but the y's the same. 
one and negative one, right? When you plug negative one and one into x squared, they both give you one, right? So here is how you check if a function is one to one. You use this thing called the horizontal line test. Have you heard of the vertical line test? Test that things are functions. So a function is one to one if and only if no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. And here's why. So you've got some picture. We'll just say for specificity that it's like y equals x squared, okay? At x equals one and x equals negative one, it gives the same y, right? So those, what this is saying is that one to one, this means every x goes to its own special y. Does every x here go to its own special y? You know, these two x's have to share a y, and they're not happy because they want their own. That's kind of the idea. Would x cubed be a one to one function? Yeah, because x cubed looks like this approximately, right? Every x has its own special y, right? All odd functions are... Oh, I don't think that's quite true. Because I think that technically... No, that's definitely not true. Sine is an odd function, right? Oh. Is sine one to one? No, it's not. It's a good conjecture, but the answer is no. Yep. It has to do with the fact that the function wrap back on itself. That's what it really matters. So the way to tell is just check and see, does a function wrap back on itself? So x cubed, is that going to be 1 to 1? Yes. Every x has its own special unique y. There's no sharing. And you can think about that because x cubed looks like this. Is x squared 1 to 1? No. Some x's have to... Like zero only goes to one number, but negative one and one both go to the same y, so that's not a one-to-one -one function. How about e to the x? It in general looks like this, right? That one is, yeah. And the reason is, is even though that line seems to kind of like horizontal and level out, it does keep slowly creeping down. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So there are examples of like cubic functions, so like maybe even x cubed minus x, for example. And that would do something like this kind of thing, where then it wouldn't be one-to-one -one anymore at all. But x cubed itself does not double back on itself at all. Okay. So mostly you should be able to, you should be able to figure out just by, it's like a basic function you know the picture of. Does that make sense? Or it's something where you're given a picture and you're asked, is this function one-to-one -one or not? <coughs> oh, if it fails the vertical line test, it isn't a function. It just loses its function. So it loses its function. It, yeah, it's not a function. And functioning means that, you know, every x goes to its, it has a, it has a predictable y. It can go, they can go to the same y, right? It's okay if two x's go to the same y. But it's not okay if x goes two places. Okay. So here is the definition of an inverse. So what this says, you have a function f who has domain a and range b. And the inverse function, we discussed how the fact that inverse is flip-flop, right? So f inverse is domain is b and its range is a. And it's defined as f inverse of y is x if and only if f of x is y. Now, let's see if I can make that make more sense. <coughs> let's use the specific examples of x cubed and the cube root of x, okay? So, you know that the cube root of 8 equals what? 2. And that's true because... 2 cubed equals 8. So here, the cube root is like the f inverse, okay? And the cubed is the f. Does that make sense? And notice what happened. You put y in and got x out. So this is the y and this is the x. And this thing is just flip-flopped. 
And really, what you can think is that this question, f inverse of y equals x, what this is asking, when does f of x equal y? That's the question it's asking you to answer. Kind of like when you're first asked to find cube root of 8, you say, OK, what number to the third power gives me 8? And that's the question you ask yourself to get that it's 2. So let's do a couple, let's do a couple things with actual numbers, because I must say variables also like make me kind of go a little bit like a. <coughs> OK. One last thing about inverses is that they cancel each other out before we move on. So we had, from the previous slide, I'm just going to get my notes so you can see it. We had f inverse of y equaled x, right? And f of x equaled y. So these two equations come from taking these two things and doing replacement. So the first one, if I have f of x, using these things, what is x equal to? What is x equal there? f inverse of y, so it's f of f inverse of y, and inverses undo each other. We said, OK, well, that thing was just equal to y. So this is how you say formally that inverses undo each other. When you compose them, you get back to where you've begun. <coughs> it's a fancy way of saying something like, if I take a number and I cube root it, and then I cube it, what do you get back? I'll say that's 8, because 8's easy. If you cube root 8 and then cube 8, what do you get out? 8. And if you do 8 cubed, and then take the cube root, what comes out? 8. So doing one thing and then the other is an example of composition. OK, so let's do some specifics here. So I told you f of 1 is 5, f of 3 is 7, and f of 8 is negative 10. Find the following. So f inverse of 7. The question you're asking yourself, to say that's equal to some x you don't know, is when does f of x equal 7? At which x does that occur? 3. So that means f inverse of 7 is equal to 3. Do you see how all that happened there is that what was inside was outside and they just flip-flopped? <coughs> so... Yep, if I haven't given you that point, you wouldn't know it. Okay. So we will definitely, we'll, we'll do these where we have a specific function. You can use the information about the original to get information about the inverse. But for these, yeah, you had to have specific values that were given. You couldn't have figured that out if I hadn't told you f of 3 was 7. Nope. So what's f inverse of 5 going to be? 1. 1. And what's f inverse of negative 10 going to be? 8. And some questions like this might come up, and you can, it might be, if I gave you f inverse of 10, you'd have to say IDK for real, not IDK like I don't know, as in like there's not enough information, right? So, because there wasn't information given about when this thing is equal to 10. Okay, and you can't assume it's negative 8, you just don't know. All right, does anybody remember, did you ever have to find inverses before? Okay, how did you do that? Switch the x and y or something, yep. So this really is y equals x cubed minus 5. Switch it around to x equals y cubed minus 5. Doing this forces you to undo the operations in the correct order. So what do you do first? Mm -hmm. And so cube root it, and that cube root power doesn't distribute. And the proper notation is f with this little negative 1. You guys are in calculus now, so you should know that. <coughs> oh, I changed your equation? I'm so sorry. Wait, what did I change it to? x plus 2 cubed minus 5. 
Okay. So sorry. So y equals x plus 2 cubed. Well, the first step is still the same, right? x equals y plus 2 cubed minus 5. First step is still to add 5, right? Sorry. I was looking at my old notes. I guess I just didn't edit this. My bad. Next step is still the same, which is cube root it. You are totally allowed to interrupt me and stop me right away if that happens again, okay? Because I edited those papers and these documents are different, so I have to go back and catch where I've made the changes and it's not going to be perfect. Okay, what's the last thing you do? Subtract 2. So your inverse function is the cube root x plus 5 minus 2. You can kind of think that here's, here's my um, explanation of this. So if you were to do stuff in the original, first you take x, operation 1 is add 2, right? What's the next thing you do once you've added 2 in the original? Cube it. Cube it. And then you take away 5, right? If you're going to undo those things, you have to go in the opposite order, okay? So the last thing you did was took away 5. The first thing you do is five. add 5. That's why this comes first. Then you cube root, because that's the other thing you did in the middle, right? And then you take away two. Mathematicians call this the shoes and socks principle. Put your socks on first and then your shoes. And to undo it, you do shoes first and then socks, right? It's the inverse. Back to bare feet. You don't want me to take my socks off and be smelly. So, okay. Sometimes it solves cleverness. I mean, my pre-calculus kids do like a gazillion of these. They better remember. Mwahaha. So find the inverse of this guy. So x equals 2y plus 3 over y minus 5. <coughs> and the problem is now you've got to solve for y, and you've got two y's, and that's stupid. Yes? Let's do that on this one. The other one's easy, okay? Thank you, though. So what's the first thing you would think of doing on this question? Multiply by y minus 5. x times y minus 5 equals 2y plus 3, or xy minus 5x equals 2y plus 3. Okay, and, okay, so, you can't, like, I mean, you could, you could divide by y, but that's really going to put y's in denominators, and that's going to be kind of silly, right? Any other ideas? Yeah, I'm going to move this y to the left side, and then move 5x to the right, although it doesn't matter which side you pick. The point is get all the y's on one side. Everything that has no y goes on the other side. So xy minus 2y equals 5x plus 3. Is everyone okay with that? And take out a greatest common factor of y. That's how you make one into two, 2 into 1. And y is equal to 5x plus 3 for x minus 2, so f inverse is 5x plus 3 over x minus 2. <coughs> and that trick where you get all of the things on the same side that have what you want to solve for will come up again in this class in section 3.5. It's just a different context. So the domain here, what's the one thing x cannot equal? 2. And you can tell that from the equation, right? So minus infinity to 2, union 2 to infinity. Now, ranges are harder to get from the equation itself because you're asking yourself, what are the possible y's? You could graph it, or you could use the fact that this is an inverse of a function you know. Does that make sense? So because this is an inverse of f, the range here is equal to the domain of f. And can you find the domain of f easily? Yeah, so what's the thing that x, what's the thing that x cannot equal for f? 5. So for the range, the y will not equal 5, because that flip-flopped. 
and you can give that as an interval as negative infinity to 5 union 5 to infinity. And that's how I test that you understand that relationship, that to find the range, you've got to look at the domain of the original. Yes? It didn't say, and so since it didn't say, if you want to say the not equal to, the one thing I'll be picky about is you must specify that domain is x and range is y. Does that make sense? Like, if you say x equals for both, that's actually incorrect. So if, you're go if I don't specify and I don't say interval, make sure you specify that domain is the x, range is the y. That's the one thing you'd have, you might get zinged on if you didn't do it this if you did it that way. But yes, you can lawyer me if I didn't say no interval necessary. <laughs> okay. Do you always have to put the interval in the bit notation? Um, well, like Natalie said, if I didn't specify, I'm not going to be picky about it. So I'll either specify or you can do either. I mean, it doesn't have a point to write that. It, it's like um, you say x never equals 2. You know, I don't really know. I think that the only reason I do it is to make sure you understand both notations in case you see them both. Does that make sense? But I don't know if there's any really specific benefit to one or the other, other than the fact that they're both u, so it's good to know that they're sort of synonymous. I mean, because x does not equal 2 is equal to that. Exactly, yeah. So as long as I specify, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Did you just find the horizontal asymptotes? It's the same thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. If you know how to find horizontal asymptotes, the value that y cannot equal is the horizontal asymptote. So yes, that is the relationship. as well. Most people don't catch that, though. So you could effectively trick me. Oh, man. Okay, sketch the graph of this and its inverse. So first of all, sketching the graph of that function, holy patoli. So there's negatives inside there. I'm going to write that as negative parenthesis x plus 2. Does that make sense? That's true a lot at all? Okay. So... This takes the function root x. What does it do to it? <coughs> Flips it over what? Over the x. And then moves it... <coughs> to the left. Mm-hmm. And one way you can tell that that's the case is this will equal 0 when x equals negative 2. Does that make sense? Just like by plugging in some numbers and stuff. So it takes this root function, which looks like this, flips it, boop, 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 oh, just that one, and then that one, like this, and moves it over to the left two. I said over x, but I meant over y, because it definitely is over the y-axis. That, that's my bad. Do you agree that it's over the y, though? Because it's inside, yeah. Okay. Alrighty, so there is the picture of negative 2 minus x. Now, let's take that equation and do the thing where we, you know, we solve for the y, so let's say take that and make it x equals square root negative 2 minus y. What's the first thing you do to um, undo the square root? Square it. And then you'd add 2, right? <coughs> by, by negative 1. So negative x squared minus 2. There is a technicality here. Um, yeah, actually, the, the, it's a bit of a tricky thing, but you have to pull the negative out to get the transformation correct. So when there's a negative inside in front of the x. So that is definitely a bit tricky. OK, so how does, what does the negative x squared minus 2 look? It's a parabola, right? Shifted how? Down 2 when it's first flipped over the which axis? 
over the x. So it's going to be down here and look like that. I'll draw the whole parabola in now, and then tell me where there's a problem. So why is there a problem with this whole parabola? Is the whole parabola a one-to-one -one function? No. So you've got to figure out, look at your original. What was the domain of the original? Great. And what was the range of the original? What's the lowest y? Zero. Does that make sense? Even though it occurs last, you still list it first, right? So what happens with the inverse? That flip-flops, right? Now, the domain of your inverse is what? Mm -hmm. And the range of your inverse should be minus infinity to negative 2. So if your domain is just 0 to infinity, what part do you keep? The part on the left of the y or part on the right of the y? Which part of this parabola is x is ranging from 0 to infinity? This half or that half? The right half is, right? So that's how you actually define inverses. Why, why is the domain 0? Why is, oh, because this is the inverse of that root function. Oh, so it has to be. It has to be. Has to be. Yep. So I, my eraser went away, so I'm forced to like use white marker. This part is not included. Yep. Exactly. And notice that there's also a relationship between the graph of the function f and the graph of its inverse. It's reflection over the diagonal. And so one more thing on the New Testament question, okay? You have to, if this happens where you have to leave part of a picture out, you have to specify that that happens by saying x bigger than or equal to 0, at least in this case. That's what it is. Do you see what I mean by that? Because technically, this parabola as an equation includes both sides unless you specify that you meant only part of it. <laughs> it's an additional statement saying this parabola but just this piece. Yes? Um, mm-hmm. Oh, you could do that here, too. You could say negative parenthesis x squared plus 2. That's also fine. You just don't have to. The reason I did it in the first one was to get the graph. You have to have a negative expression of stuff to get the shift correct. Mm -hmm. Let me come back to it, okay, because I've got too much other stuff to cover. But that, that is the technical reason. What it, The point of this example was not that. It was really more that... If you have something where you, the picture you get is not one-to-one, -one, you've got to tell me you mean only part of it. That's the part that's really important there. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this is where those logarithms come in. So technically, as long as your base isn't one and you've got that flat line function, your exponential function is one-to-one -one and it has an inverse. So, for example, the function 2 to the x goes through the point... Uh, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4. That's the picture of f of x equals 2 to the x. It's a one-to-one it's one -one function. It has an inverse. Its inverse is this function log base 2. That is its name. And the way you construct points on it is you just take the points here and you flip-flop them. This point was 0, 1. When you flip-flop it, it becomes 1, 0, which is that right there, right? So there's 1, 0. This point was 1, 2. It becomes 2, 1. Uh, that next point was um, 2, 4 becomes... 4, 2. What happens to the asymptote? So it was the x-axis, now it's going to be the y-axis. So there's a picture of f inverse of x is log base 2x. I think we did that with e and ln yesterday, right? Okay. 
if it was 3 to the x, you'd graph 3 to the x and then flip-flop those points to get log base 3, right? So the opposite of log base 5, 5 to the x. Opposite of 10, yes? So is it always like the inverse is y Yeah, it is always the case that the diagonal y equals x, that the inverse's picture is a reflection over that diagonal. That is always true. Yep. Do you guys see what she means? Okay. What is the domain of this log base 2 thing? Mm -hmm. And what's its range? All real numbers. Yep. Remember how I said yesterday that there are three commandments in this class and the third one is thou shalt not log negatives? Does that ring a bell? I think I said that right. And this is the reason. Because its domain or its inputs are zero to infinity, you can't take a log of negatives. It's not possible. And I'll, we'll have some specific examples that also discuss it in more concrete terms, but that's the reason. Not a possible input. Your calculator is going to say domain error and it's going to cry and give up. And there's no corresponding like imaginary log numbers. It just doesn't just don't do them. Okay. So because these functions are inverses, when you put them together, what are you going to get? You, like so, if I do g of x and then apply f to it, I get back what I had to begin with, which was x. Okay. So that's going to equal x. The question is, is what is that going to look like? So what's g of x equal to in this particular case? Log base b. <coughs> and so f of log base b means you put that log base b into this picture, into that function, which puts the log into the exponent, right? So b to the log base b of x equals x, as long as those bases match. So if I had 2 to the log base 2 of, say, I don't know, 7, what's that going to equal? 7. OK, well, the technical restriction now is if you're going to do this, stuff has to work in log base b. So because that's true, you have to have x is bigger than 0. And you can't do negatives because you can't put negatives into logs. Terror will be smote upon you. This one, if you do the composition in the opposite order with inverses, you also still get x. It doesn't matter in which thing stuff is undone, it's still undone. So this becomes g of b to the x. <coughs> and if you put that b to the x inside the log, you get log base b of b to the x. So if I wrote, for example, log 2 of 2 to the 7th, what's that got to equal? 7. And is there any funniness here? Like, is there any number you can't plug into an exponential? No. So in that case, it's for all x, as in like, all real numbers are okay in that direction. Okay. Alrighty, great. Okay, so find the exact value of these couple logs. So revert back to the whole cube root analogy. How do you analyze like cube root of, we'll say a thousand this time? What's the question you ask yourself in your head? Say what to the 3 equals 1,000, right? This thing, say equals what? You're asking, in, when you do roots, you're looking for the base, right? When you do logs, you're looking for the exponent. You're saying 5 to the what power gives me 125. Do you see how it's kind of analogous to that? So it's quite analogous to a cube root, right? OK. And so and as you can see, that the, this 5 is the base there, the base there as well, right? So I think that happens for a nice number, doesn't it? Three. I think it's 3. Yep. So that is 3. 
Okay, 2 to the what power makes 1 32nd? So what kind of powers make fractions like that? Negative, Negative numbers. So just think 2 to the what make 32? 5, right? So this will be, uh -huh, but it'd be negative 5 because of the fact that you've got a fraction. Okay. And this is 9 to the what power gives you 3? Half. And that's because root 9 is 3, and root 9 is the same as 9 to the 1 half power, right? Okay. Let's add just one more in. Let's try to do log base 2 of negative 4, just to illustrate why you really can't do these. So what's the question you ask yourself? 2 to the what equals negative 4, yep. And no matter what number you put into that, you get a positive result. Does that make sense? Like 2 to the positive numbers make positive numbers, right? 2 to the 0 is 1. When you plug in negatives, you get things that get close to but never get all the way to 0, right? So is there any number that you know of that will make that happen? No. That's why this is, that's the tech, another reason why it's not possible to do logs of negatives. Is there any mathematical situation in which you would include imaginary numbers for logarithm? <coughs> there might be, but I don't know about it. So you won't see it probably. If I haven't seen it, you won't see it. Unless you become better mathematicians than I am, which is totally possible. But, okay. but not, not, in your, not in your near future. <clears throat> okay, and logs have weird properties like these. Like, does it seem a little strange that when you um, log a product, you then can add the logs? Does that seem a bit weird? A little, a little weird, maybe. So they come from a little bit from the rules for exponents. So um, I'm going to prove to you why one of them works, okay? And then we'll just kind of accept the others. So <clears throat> log base b of x, y is the same thing as log base b, b to the log b of x. For now, I would never ask you to come up with that trick on your own, but do you agree that that's actually true? Is it true that x equals b to the log base bx? You buy that. And because and you, and of the whole cancellation thing, right? And you buy that b to the log base b of y is equal to y, right? I just did a clever thing. I watched a lot of Doctor Who, so, you know, British comes up all the time. Okay, and so then you're like, well... I know that if I have common bases and they're multiplied, the exponents do what? They add. So that becomes log base b, b to the one singular power of log bx plus log by. Okay? And if you have log b and then b to the stuff, what happens to this log b and this b? They cancel and you just get stuff. And so this is log bx plus log by. They come from the rules for exponents. Does the cancel or become one? <coughs> they, um, these cancel and just give you back the thing. Like when I had that b and a 7, you would just get 7. And if this were like, you know, x squared plus 2, you just get x squared plus 2. So this cancels and this cancels and just gives you that as a, like, you know, normal size, no longer exponent thing. Let me just, one more thing. Multiply. It's the same as the rules for exponents, right? When you multiply, exponents add. When you multiply, the logs add. Right? Um, ex number two is almost the exact same thing, except for I put a division bar here, and that division bar would make this into subtraction. So that's the same thing. This next one is the thing about the power polybound. That one's actually pretty easy to explain with a specific number. Like if I gave you log base b of x cubed, that's the same thing as log b of x times x times x, right? 
And if you accept rule number one, that means you have log b of x added how many times? You got log bx plus log bx plus log base b of x. How many log base b of x's is that? Three. So that's three things you're going to have to know. I'm sorry it was so quick because I have like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. This class is not long enough. You guys are like, oh my god, yes it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, use properties of logs to express the following things as one logarithm. So log base 2 of 80 minus log base 2 of 5. So if you put these back together, they condense down to one log, and what happens to the 80 and the 5? They divide. What is 80 over 5? Oh, look at that was clever. What's log base 2 of 16? 4. So this one, what are those numbers in front actually? What'd they come from? They came from powers, yep. So that's log base b plus log of c squared minus log of d cubed. And if you put them together into one log, Yeah, which things are B squared? C squared. B, C squared divided by D cubed. Everything that is positive came from a numerator. Everything that's negative came from a denominator because you did something minus something else. You could also think that this negative could also be part of a power. It could be Z to the negative third power, which ends up in the denominator as well. <coughs> okay. Natural logarithms, so if you have e to the x, its opposite inverse is log base e x, which is usually written as ln. They just gave that one a special couple letters. I don't know why, they just did it. Not nice. <laughs> okay. So we're going to use that idea to solve some equations. So if you're solving this, what's the first thing you do? Add 1, right? So you have ln of x plus 5 equals uh, 8. You've got to think, what is the opposite of ln? E. And what you've got to do is you've got to exponentiate both sides, which means that both the left side and the right side go into a power. And that's because then E and ln will cancel because they're inverses. So x plus 5 is e to the 8th, whatever weird number that is. And so x equals e to the 8th minus 5. What do you think the most common mistake students made when they did this with me in the past is? Any ideas? Here, instead of saying e to the 8th, they'd say 8e. Is 8e different than e to the 8th? Mm -hmm. Oh, heck yeah, it's hugely different. And that's the thing you've got to remember is that for these to cancel, it has to be inside of the exponent. Just make it obvious you put it into an exponent. And then if you calculate it, maybe, if not, whatever, you know. Or. Okay, this one. First step, minus 4. Minus four. Now, what do you apply to undo E? Mm -hmm. So 2x minus 5 equals ln 6. And that's just some weird number, so you've got to like ln it for anything else, but, you know, just leave it alone. And now how would you continue getting x alone? Add. Uh-huh. And can that 5 and that 6 can't combine? Nope, because 6 must be ln before 5 is added. Mm -hmm. On quizzes, you'll be asked to give exact answers, not approximations. 
Okay, and then this one we already kind of solved. We did something quite similar. So what would be the first thing you would do? Subtract one. Subtract one. And then, mm -hmm. oh, yep, uh huh, sorry, thanks. Woo. Okay, and flip the sign, of course. I can't believe I missed that. Don't just don't tell my algebra one students I made that mistake. I'm gonna be so embarrassed. Okay, and then what do you do to undo ln? E. e. So e to the ln x is less than, is e to the negative first an okay thing to do? Yep, okay. So you get x is bigger than e to the negative first, which is the same thing as one over e, right? So that will be one over e to infinity. <coughs> All right. And then we have some pictures, and I think we have to do inverse trig functions tomorrow. So ln of x, sketch your graph of that function. We did this yesterday. So first you could sketch e to the x, which looks like that, right? That one has a horizontal asymptote. What will, e, what will ln of x have? A vertical asymptote. And I don't care about like super, super specific points. I mean, I care that you know that it goes through um, one, zero, and that you get the asymptote in the right place, you get the general shape correct, but just like that you get that LN looks like that. If you don't know it, flashcard it. So. <coughs> and then you're asked to do some shifts, if I assume, right? Like this. So take that LN of X picture, which you have graphed in the pre previous part and shift it, what, uh, left or right? Mm -hmm. And up three. It now has a vertical asymptote at x equals two instead of x equals zero. Are trig functions one to one? Do they pass the horizontal line test? Is a horizontal line going to only intersect them once? No. Oh God, heck no, right? Like it intersects them an infinite number of times. Like they are so not one to one, it's like really bad. What about tangent when you restrict it? Well, that's the thing is if you don't restrict it, they're not one to one. But if you do restrict it, they are. Okay, so the question is how do you do the restrictions? Hmm? Don't you have to restrict tangent for it to exist? No, nope. because well, we'll, we'll get to tangent in a second, okay? okay? So first let's do sine and cosine. So roughly speaking, regular sine looks like this. This is pi, that's negative pi. There'd be two pi. No, 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 no. There you go. Okay, so there is y equals sine x. I don't know how I just missed two letters of that. <coughs> okay, so when you find the inverse of x squared, because that's one you can probably get pretty easily. So there's y equals x squared. What, half of, what part of the parabola do you just take to get the square root part? Do you take the left half or the right half? So if we were finding the inverse of, you know the inverse of x squared is root x, right? But x squared has the same problem as sine in the fact that it's not a one-to-one -one function, right? So you actually can't find its inverse unless you only look at part of it. Does that make sense? So if we were going to say invert x squared, doesn't it make the most sense to just take only that part, all the positive half? 
I don't like that. I don't like negative anyway. There, so it's stupid. We just have to take the positive part, and you see that the root function is the inverse. Obviously, you restricted it so that it was one to one, and you could find the inverse. So these are inverses with the slight technicality that you have to be on the interval where x is bigger than zero. Okay. So. All right. So. What you have to look at, you look and see, okay, you want to take part of the function so that you get all of the possible y values out, but no y value twice. Does that idea make sense? So all the y's, but no y twice. So how could you look at sine and get all the y values? Like, could you go from zero to pi? Would that get all the y values? No, and it also would get some of them twice, right? Okay, you could look at it from like maybe pi halves to there, but that kind of feels like a funny interval, doesn't it, a little bit? So what is typically done with sine is you look only from there to there. Because that encompasses all of the possible y values. Does that make sense? So you look at y equals sine x on the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then it's going to be 1 to 1. <coughs> In other words, this is the restricted domain. Um, what would the range be? Negative 1 to 1. Okay, so then for y equals sine inverse, what is its domain going to be? Negative 1 to 1. What is its range going to be? Mm -hmm. And that negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 is a convention that is pretty much agreed upon. The domain restrictions for inverse like secant, cosecant, and cotangent are not agreed upon, and we're not going to talk about them because they're silly. Okay. Now here's one more thing to think about with this. So with sine, your input is an angle, and out comes the sine, right? So this one, you input, angle, get out, sine of angle, right? Does that idea make sense? That's the order in which stuff is done. The pi over whatever is an angle. That's what it means, right? So with this one, what is your input? Because stuff is reversed, you input the sine of the angle. And what comes out? Out comes the angle. And the one tricky thing about that, the angle must be in here. That's what it means to be in the range, right? The output is within that range of values. So will sine inverse ever give an output of pi? No, because pi is outside of negative pi halves to pi halves, right? OK, so that's the tricky, the tricky thing to remember here is that the angles that you spit out are in that interval specifically. OK? If you like punch things in your calculator, you're never going to get values outside of that unless your calculator is in degrees, in which case it's negative 90 to 90. So, but that's a special story. <coughs> uh, okay, now, can I do inverse cosine? Let me know when. Okay. The, you craft the inverse by like flip-flopping it, and the axes are like, you know, different, and it's kind of weird. I'm not going to make you graph that inverse ever. Just okay. figure out what values of inverse sine are. Okay. Yep. But the point is that the graph is this part flip-flopped, but it's just the restricted part. Yep. Good question. So cosine's picture. Yeah. So for cosine x... Okay. Zoom tight. 
there's a rough sketch of cosine. Ish, you know, it keeps going, but cosine quick. So what do you think the most natural interval is to look at for this guy to get all of the possible y values? Zero to pi. Zero to pi. That's the domain, and the range is still negative 1 to 1, right? Even though it does occur in the opposite order, the range is just a list of the potential y values, not necessarily or the order in which they occur. So for cosine inverse, what's going to be the domain? <coughs> negative 1 to 1, yep. <coughs> And what's going to be its range? Zero to, pi. Zero to pi. So cosine inverse will never give you a negative angle out, for example, right? The angles it will give you is between ze always be between zero and pi or zero and 180. OK. So with that in mind, let's actually find sine inverse and cosine inverse of some stuff. You ready for some stuff? And these should be pretty things you can guess and check by knowing your unit circle pretty well. So the question this is asking, when you're finding sine inverse of root 3 over 2, is it saying sine of what angle gave you root 3 over 2 in the interval from negative pi halves to pi halves? So what angle has a sine of root 3 over 2? Pi over 3. And sine inverse is a function. You know, one input gives one output. That is the output. OK, this is saying cosine of what makes negative a half? and specifically in the interval from 0 to pi. So I think that be this angle, right? As of the 3 is the first one, right? So what angle is that? Negative, uh, no, 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3, great. Everyone right with that one? Okay, so most of them are guessy checky, um, except for some stuff like part C that involves a little bit of trickery, which maybe you have or haven't seen before. It actually, this thing is in Alex, so you should have run across it if you were working through your stuff, but maybe not yet. So we're saying arc, so, sorry, backtrack for a second. If I could work that inside thing out, I could find tangent of it, right? Does that make sense? So let's just figure out what is arc sine of one-fifth equals, I don't know, something, right? Some angle. And so that tells me that sine of my questionable angle is one-fifth. You buy that? OK. Um, instead of a question mark, can I use a variable? Because it'll make me feel better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make that a theta and make that a theta. OK. But you can think theta question mark. Variables are just question marks with so specific, you know, same thing. OK. And so then you can use right triangle trigonometry. Sine is what over what in a right triangle? Opposite over hypotenuse, which means the other side is what? How could you find that side? B squared is C squared, yeah. So 5 squared would be 1 squared plus B squared. I think that side is root 24. Tell me if you disagree. You agree? OK. <coughs> OK, so here is how we're going to finish this. So the original question that I had, the tangent of arc sine of stuff, so tangent of arc sine 
of a fifth, that's equal to tangent of theta. Tell me why is it okay that I did that? Look at the first line I wrote. What did I say arc sine one-fifth is equal to? Theta. So is it okay if I replace an arc sine of one-fifth with theta since they're equal? Yeah, okay. And now can you use your triangle to find tangent of theta? Tangent is opposite over adjacent, right? So that would be... Mm -hmm. Or if you rationalize root 24 over 24. Alex will make you rationalize to get stuff correct. So just FYI. It's probably also going to make you simplify that root 24. So let's just do it because I wouldn't really care, but the system does this. So 24 is 4 times 6, right? So that's 2 root 6 over 24 or root 6 over 12. But the thing that's kind of funky, at least I think this is what other students would protest about, is they, they feel as if they haven't used this arc sine of one-fifth. Does that feel like a little bit wrong? But you did use it, and my argument is you used it to make the triangle, right? And so that determined what that triangle was, which determined what your answer was. Does that make sense? So it gets could, could, could used in kind of a funky way, but that's how you can evaluate stuff like this. It also can be used to simplify expressions, which we'll do in like another, in like in a next one of our next examples. <coughs> but most of the ones that you'll see that I really care, like there'll be a quiz question about the basic ones as well. Okay. Okay, tan inverse. So, where are tangents asymptotes? Mm -hmm. Pi over two negative pi over 2. Technically, as a function, tangent tessellates, right? I mean, as in this pattern repeats. Does that make sense? The next asymptote would be at 3 pi over 2 in the positive direction. So tangent isn't a 1 to 1 function either. Does that make sense? Okay. But which part of it do you think is most like common to look at for inverting it? Yeah, the middle part, right? Because why not? It's around zero. Zero is an awesome number. So here we go. Look at that part only. So look at y equals tangent x on, and this time it's an open interval. Why is it an open interval? Not defined at the endpoints, right? Mm -hmm. What's tangent's range? Mm -hmm. And the range will be all real numbers. OK, so for tan inverse, what is its domain going to be? All real numbers. What will its range be? Inverse tangent is the only one where I care that you know what the picture looks like. But does everybody get the whole domain range flip flop and the restriction? That part's okay. Okay, so when you graph the inverse, everything flip flops, right? So tangent had vertical asymptotes at negative pi halves and pi halves. What does inverse tangent have? horizontal asymptotes in these same places. <laughs> so there's y equals pi halves. Here's y equals negative pi halves. And does inverse tangent go through the origin? Yes, because the point that is 0, 0 on the original graph flip-flops and stays 0, 0. Does that make sense? Okay, and then but this part that usually goes up towards this vertical asymptote is going to now go up towards the horizontal asymptote. Like that, and like this. <coughs> so, 
So what happens to inverse tangent as the x's get really big? What does inverse tangent get close to? So as the x's get huge, as the x's get huge, you go this way, right? Inverse tangent goes closer and closer to pi halves, right? As the x's get hugely negative, inverse tangent heads out this way, right? And gets close to negative pi halves. I don't know if it's just me, but I, I like that. I like making people remember that picture, so it might happen. Probably in a different context. Okay. So find some specifics. So this is saying tangent of what angle gives us negative 1, and what is our specific interval? Mm hmm Okay. So in the unit circle, what you're looking at there is you're kind of looking at this half either in the positive or negative direction. So is tangent going to be negative in quadrant one? Mm -hmm. How about quadrant four? Yep. Yes. And so that angle is seven pi quarters, but seven pi quarters isn't in, our, in, the, in, the, in the range of values we can pick. So what is seven pi quarters so that it's in there? Negative pi quarters. If students make any mistake, is that they give seven pi quarters. And it's sort of technically correct. It's, it's, it's correct if, like it's more right than nothing, but it's a little bit wrong. Does that make sense? Yes? Do you, do you want to oh, good question. In this case, you don't add plus two pi n because the fact that it's an inverse function means there's only one output. So if the question says find inverse tangent of one, there's one answer. If it says solve tan x equals negative 1, there's an infinite answers. It's a little bit of a subtle difference, but does that make sense? <coughs> so inverse tangent of 1, one answer. Solve this equation means find all the answers. But the inverse tangent refers to a specific one. OK. When is tangent going to be root 3? Hmm. That's it's either, it's either 30 degrees, which is, has coordinates root 3 over 2, a half, or it's pi thirds, which has coordinates 1 half, root 3 over 2. Right? It's one of those two points. And so just take the sine divided by cosine and see which one gives you root 3. Does the first one give you root 3 if you do the y divided by x? The over 2 doesn't really matter, right? I think that's going to give you 1 over root 3. Whereas this one, if you do root 3 over 2 divided by a half, you get root 3. So the angle there would be pi thirds. And how about inverse tangent of 0? Zero? 0. So trickiest bit, restricted domain, just one answer. Okay. And then one last thing, and then we'll finish this lesson for good. <coughs> okay. So this is quite similar to the question we had where we had um, arc sine of a fifth. So you start by taking this inverse tangent of x over 2, and you say, well, that is equal to some angle I'm going to call it theta, because theta is my favorite Greek letter for angles. You could also call it omega if you wanted to, but we're just going to use theta for now. And if that's true, doesn't x over 2 equal tan theta? Do you buy that? Yes? OK. So then construct a triangle. And in that triangle, you can draw it whatever way you want. I just tend to prefer this way. Where do the x and the 2 go in that triangle? Is the 2 is the adjacent. Yep, exactly. And then you know that x squared plus 2 squared is c squared. 
So c is the square root of x squared plus 4. Um, square roots never, ever distribute over addition. So don't say that this is equal to x plus 2 because it isn't. I reckon there's lots of reasons why that's not true. But for now, just it's not. Don't do it. Okay. Great. So they're in okay with the triangle construction, even though it's kind of weird. What is that? Okay, so, sorry, distractible. So going back to our original problem, sine of tan inverse of x over two, that's the same thing as sine of theta, right? Because tan inverse of x over two is equal to theta. And can you use your triangle to find sine of theta? Is the opposite over hypotenuse, right? So what would it be? What's the opposite side? Uh huh. Over. The big root thing. Big root thing. Yep, I like that. X squared plus four. I don't know about so you, but. <coughs> yeah, and this actually this this works specifically because of the fact that. This inner side is an inverse <coughs> trig function, which means you can say, oh, it's equal to an angle, and then you can make a triangle out of it. It wouldn't work if they were reversed. Does that make sense? Like, if I had tan inverse on the outside and sine on the inside, then you couldn't do this thing. The fact that you can go from this first step that I wrote to the second step is because this is an inverse. Oh, so the inside Does that make has sense? to be an inverse. The inside has to be an inverse for this to work. And if it's the other direction, you'd be able to find sine or cosine of whatever you've been given to do it. So these are quite specific. What about the second one? Is that an inverse? The second one is all, arc cosine is an inverse, but this one involves one trick. And the trick that it involves is that this, remember this angle that we discussed yesterday, this identity? That sine 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. Remember that? So this is actually the same thing. It's sine of 2, and this arc cosine of x is like that x. You see what I mean? I can do it a little bit different. Let me write this as sine of 2u. That's 2 sine u cosine u. Changing the letter doesn't do anything, right? So the way to figure out this one, is the funky thing is the 2 that's messing stuff up in there. You've got to make it sine of just an angle, not twice an angle. So the thing to do there is write this as 2 sine of arc cosine x cosine of arc cosine x. And the thing to notice is that, see how that is the same thing as like that x. That might come up as a web assign question, but I think it's, if I gave it to you as a quiz question, I'd say use this identity to figure it out the rest of the way, because that is definitely quite tricky. One of those is actually really, really easy. If you apply cosine to arc cosine, they're just going to cancel and just give you x. And then this first one we can figure out using a triangle. So you let arc cosine of x equal theta. Two c's there. So x will equal cosine of theta. And you have to write that as a ratio to be able to construct your triangle, but how could you make x into a ratio? x over 1. So there's theta. Cosine is adjacent. Hypotenuse. This side is going to be root 1 minus x squared from your Pythagorean theorem. <coughs> so that will equal 2 sine of theta. And I think sine of theta is just the root, isn't it? Be 2 root 1 minus x squared times x, or 2x root 1 minus x squared. 
I know those are weird. I think what you're going to have to do is there are homework questions that involve these. Just take some time and see if you can do a few yourself. Because the only way to get around the fact that they're strange is to kind of play with them a little bit. But they're something that when I went through and edited what Alex to give you, I added them in because they weren't originally there. So. Okay, so I think that's the end of this lesson, right? Yes, okay. So I'm going to save it.